Hello everyone, welcome back to my channel for a brand new Mystery with Molly. If you are new around here, if you've never seen my face on your screen before, then hi, my name is Molly. And I post true crime videos like this every single week. So if you think that that is something that you might want to stick around for, then please do subscribe. And don't forget to switch on the little notification bell so that YouTube will let you know whenever I post a new video. This week, we are going to be talking about a solved case from the east of England. When a successful children's author just suddenly disappeared one day in April of 2016. Initially, her case wasn't necessarily considered a high priority for the police as it didn't seem as though foul play was involved here. However, eventually this all changed when some very shady behaviour was exhibited by someone very close to the investigation and they ultimately became a suspect in her disappearance and, as it would turn out, murder. But when this case was finally closed, another seemed to re open as the police realised that this killer may have had more than just one victim. But quickly before we get into the case, I would just like to say a huge thank you to Beam for very kindly sponsoring this section of the video. Now I have mentioned before that I have struggled with bouts of insomnia for literally years now. I can often find it difficult to fall asleep or stay asleep. And of course when this happens, it can hugely impact my day-to-day -day life. It means that I feel so incredibly tired throughout the day, meaning that I've not really got any motivation or energy. So I'm constantly on the lookout for things that can help with this, can help improve my sleeping pattern. And that is where Beam comes in. Beam are a company that makes this dream sleep powder. It's a luxurious hot cocoa drink that is clinically shown to improve your sleep. Dream contains high quality natural sleep ingredients with no added sugar. And it is also gluten free, dairy free, vegan, keto friendly, and with no GMOs. Now, I'll be completely honest, I was really sceptical when I first heard about Dream because, like I said, I've had issues with my sleep for so, so long. So I just didn't think that it was something that would work for me, but oh my god, how wrong I was. Genuinely, after the first time I tried it, I had the best night's sleep that I'd had in weeks. And now, Dream is an essential part of my evening routine. I have my cup of hot cocoa about 45 minutes before I go to bed, and I honestly sleep like a baby. And it means that I wake up the next next morning feeling really refreshed and motivated and just just happy because I've had a good night's sleep and let me tell you Dream is just delicious too they offer several different flavors my personal favorite is just their original cinnamon cocoa one but I think I'm gonna try their sea salt caramel one next because that just sounds so good I really could not recommend Beam enough particularly if you do struggle with insomnia like me I'm gonna get a bit deep here but I know from experience how awful it is and how much just a lack of sleep can really get you down and affect your mood. So for me, their dream powder has literally been a game changer. And Beam are very kindly offering my viewers an exclusive discount of up to 35% off when you click on the link in the description box and use the code Westbrook. Or alternatively, you can also scan the QR code that is on screen right now to receive that offer too. And Beam is also available to order on subscription, which can save you 20% every single month. A massive thank you once again to Beam for sponsoring this video and supporting the channel, 100% one of my favourite brands that I've ever worked with. Thank you to you guys watching for always showing your support to the sponsors on this channel and now let's just get into the case. But just before we continue, please listen carefully to the following. This video contains themes such as domestic abuse and animal cruelty. Viewer discretion is advised. So for this week's case, we are going back around eight years now to the spring of 2016 in Royston which is a little town located in the county of Hertfordshire in the east of England. And this is Helen Bailey. She was a 51-year-old woman who lived in Royston. However, Royston is not where Helen's story begins because she was actually born and raised in a town called Pontyland in Newcastle-upon-Tyne. She was born on the 22nd of August 1964. Her parents were called George and Eileen Bailey and Helen was one of two children. She had a brother called John. And as far as I'm aware, they were were a happy little family of four whilst Helen was growing up. I couldn't find any information online which suggested otherwise. But when it came to Helen's school life, that seemed to be not so much a happy environment for her. Sources state that Helen never really had many friends in school, which meant that she would feel quite lonely. And she would often write about this, about her school life in her diaries. Pretty much every single day, she would get home from school and just write pages upon pages in her diary, because that was something that she was 
really passionate about writing. She loved to write. Helen was always a very smart and intelligent person and after leaving high school she went to a university in London where she studied physiology because her dream was to become a forensic scientist and following this she ended up doing postgraduate research work in a teaching hospital although she ultimately decided that actually this wasn't quite the right fit for her career-wise this wasn't what she wanted to do and so she changed career paths and decided that she wanted to work in licensing and marketing within the media world and during her time in this field she worked on some very big projects she worked on campaigns for some huge tv shows including garfield the rugrats and even nintendo and she even got to a point where she became secretary for the marketing and licensing company that she worked for and she became very close to the head of the company a man named john sinfield helen and john got along really well they actually started dating they fell in love and they ended up getting married they tied the knot in 1996 and they just seemed to be the perfect couple they seemed so happy together and john was such a huge supporter of everything that helen did he believed that she could do anything that she set her mind to and something that he always encouraged her to do and get back into was writing as i mentioned before she loved writing as a kid and she was very good at it she always had a passion for writing fiction books specifically books for children and teenagers apparently she wrote more than 20 books many of which when they were eventually released and published were incredibly successful particularly one book series that she published called the crazy world of electra brown helen was even nominated for the queen of teen writers award in 2010 for this book series it did really well so overall life seemed to be for the most part great for helen bailey she became a very successful children's author she was still happily married to john by 2011 helen and john had been together for about 22 years and that year 2011 was their 15th wedding anniversary and in february of 2011 the couple decided to go on a holiday together they decided to go away to barbados for two weeks however what was supposed to be just a nice relaxing much needed breakaway for the couple actually turned out to be a living nightmare when tragedy struck on the 27th of february 2011 john and helen were just relaxing sunbathing on a beach in barbados when john decided that he was going to go into the sea for a swim so he did just that he got into the water whilst helen continued sunbathing but shortly after this helen heard john calling for her and shouting for how because he was struggling to stay afloat he got stuck in a riptide and the waves were pulling him under the water so of course helen immediately started panicking she alerted the lifeguard and people quickly started trying to rescue john but tragically they couldn't get to him fast enough and he drowned and died on that holiday i mean can you even imagine how traumatic this must have been for helen like i said they were going on this holiday to just unwind and spend time together and instead she lost him helen lost the love of her life the man that she had spent more than two decades with and she had to go back home back to england without him back to the place where she and john lived together alone so helen was now a widower at the age of only about 47 she was 47 when john died and while she was going through all of this heartbreak all of this grieving she actually decided to start her own online blog which was all about grief she called it planet grief and in her blog post she often wrote about how normal everyday things become so much more difficult when you are grieving when you've lost a partner so one example that she gave was suddenly going to the supermarket and realizing that you only need to buy food for one person now not two about how something even as simple as that is so hard to almost process for someone who is grieving and eventually this blog turned into a book helen wrote a book about her grief which was called when bad things happen in good bikinis life after death and a dog called boris because helen had a little dog called boris he was a little dachshund who she just doted on boris was said to have always been at helen's side and helen actually went on sky news where she was interviewed about her blog and her book so if i'm able to i'll include some video clips now coping with grief is something we all have to deal with at some stage in our lives the internet 
can be a source of great support and comfort to people when they lose a loved one. We're joined now by blogger and author Helen Bailey, uh, and that's something that you turn to. Um, tell us what, what happened to you. Well, the book is based on a blog that I started after my husband drowned whilst we were in Barbados in February 2011. He went into the sea for a swim against my advice and he got caught in a rip current and drowned and I was wearing a bikini whilst this was going on. And I am a professional writer, I'm used to churning out thousands of words, very tight deadlines and I found myself completely and utterly shut down with grief. I couldn't couldn't write anything. So I turned to blogging to chronicle the sort of everyday minutiae of grief. So the buying a single scotch egg, pulling the wheelie bin out at night on my own, going to parties as a single person that I hadn't done for 25 years. And eventually the book, the blog became a book. And um, the book is a collection of as it happened grief posts reflections on the last four and a half years and also material that I did write about at the time but I didn't feel that a blog was the right medium to put such personal material out. So for you documenting your, your innermost thoughts actually helped you through that, that grief process? It was, it was invaluable. I so the book was very successful and so was the blog actually. Initially the Planet Grief blog was just a private thing that Helen would do as a way of getting out all of her thoughts and feelings so that she I guess didn't keep them bottled up. But when the blog went public it started to get shared a lot over social media and what was built from that was this little community of other people like like Helen who were also struggling with grief, other widowers, these people found comfort in Helen's blog because it was something that they could relate to and it made them realise that they weren't alone. Her blog helped so many people honestly, one of which was a man named Ian Stewart. He was I think also around his 50s and in October of 2011, so about eight months after Helen's husband John died, Ian Stewart joined the community on Helen's Planet Grief blog because he had actually lost his partner too. He used to be married to a woman named Diane Stewart and he and Diane had two children together, two sons. However, she tragically and very suddenly died just the year prior in 2010 due to epilepsy. So Ian turned to Helen's blog for help and support. He was part of these online bereavement groups and it was through this that he started chatting to Helen Bailey. The two started chatting very regularly. They obviously had a lot in common because of what they had both been through losing their partners and they formed a friendship and actually this friendship between Ian and Helen quickly developed into something more. They began a relationship, they fell in love with each other which just made Helen so incredibly happy. Ian made her happy. I can imagine that after losing John, her husband of 15 years, she probably would have thought well that's it, I'm, I'm never going to experience love again, I'm going to be on my own forever now. So when Ian came along she was just over the moon and she actually spoke a lot about the love that she had found with Ian in her new book When Bad Things Happen in Good Bikinis. She described how she had found her happy ending with Ian and in the book she referred to him as her quote gorgeous grey-haired widower. Eventually she and Ian actually got engaged so they were planning to be married at some point and together they moved into a beautiful big house in the town of Royston in Hertfordshire. It was five bedrooms, it had a swimming pool, it was worth about 1.5 million pounds which I mean they could afford. Helen was a very wealthy woman because of how successful all of her books had been and they moved there with Ian's two sons from obviously his previous marriage. Helen was really well liked by all of her neighbours in Royston, apparently she would often invite them round for a cuppa and a slice of cake. She was described as being a very warm and kind and friendly woman and yeah overall Helen seemed happy again. She seemed really content and settled with Ian in their new house. Life seemed to be going really well for her once again. Or at least that was until 2016. So about five years after she lost John and she met Ian when bizarrely 51 year old Helen Bailey just suddenly disappeared. It was Friday the 15th of April 2016 when a 999 operator received a call from none other than Ian Stewart. Helen 
Helen's fiance and he was calling the police to report Helen as missing. Ian said that Helen had actually been missing since the 11th of April, so for about four days by this point. But the reason he hadn't reported her as missing until now was because he told the operator that Helen had been struggling a lot with anxiety lately. She'd been feeling very anxious about a couple of different things and he actually said that she had left him a note in their house in Royston which said that she was going to basically just go away for a few days because she needed a break and it seemed as though she had taken her dog Boris with her because he also wasn't in the house. Ian said on the call that he and Helen did have this little cottage in the town of Broadstairs in Kent which was kind of like a writer's retreat for Helen. Whenever she wanted to write something new, a new book, she would go there. So he did think that maybe that was where she had gone but he told the operator that Helen's brother John had been to the cottage in Broadstairs to see if Helen was in fact there but she wasn't and because no one had heard from her in days by this point the family were growing concerned and so they thought that it was best to file a missing persons report on the 15th. So Hertfordshire police received this report and as you can imagine because of the circumstances Helen's case wasn't really considered a high priority for the police initially because I mean she had only been missing for four days and of course Ian said that she wanted to go away for a little while. She was feeling anxious and she needed to just get away and of course she is a grown woman. She has every right to do that. So when they first received this report it wasn't thought by the police that you know anything really sinister had happened to Helen Bailey. They just assumed that she would turn up at some point and that she would be fine. So yeah I don't think they really felt the need to act straight away but then a week went by. A whole week with no sign of Helen and zero contact from her whatsoever. She hadn't been in touch with anyone in her life, not even to let them know that she was okay, despite the fact that she probably would have known that people would have been worrying about her by this point. And so as her family's concerns grew, so did the police's and they officially launched their investigation into the disappearance of Helen Bailey. The police started just taking statements from pretty much everyone in Helen's life, all of her family, her friends, obviously her fiance Ian. I believe it was about 11 days after Helen was last seen on the 22nd of April 2016 when police went to speak to Ian at his and Helen's home in Royston and they just asked him for his account on the day that Helen went missing because it seemed as though he was the last person that had seen her. So Ian said that that day, the 11th of April, seemed like a pretty normal one initially. He said that Helen had put some stuff into his car boxes in there full of stuff to take to the local rubbish dump because she didn't want them anymore. So he was going to take them to the rubbish tip for her. He said that following this he went back to bed because he was feeling quite tired whilst Helen was in her office in the house, presumably writing or something. He said that after waking up he left the house to go to a doctor's appointment. He said that he also went to their solicitor's office at some point that day to drop some paperwork off and then when he eventually eventually returned he noticed that both Helen and Boris were gone. There was no sign of them in the house and I believe it was then when he found this note from Helen which said that she needed some time away for a few days. But again as time was going by this was almost getting harder and harder to believe that she had just gone away for a while of her own accord. Especially because her family, her mother and her brother told the police that this was very out of character for Helen. She would have known the distress that she would have been putting her family through so there was no way that she would have left it this long without getting in touch. Soon weeks passed and there were still no developments really in the case, still no sign or word from Helen and at this point police really started to ramp up the investigation. Missing posters were created and distributed around the area and surrounding areas, they appealed to the public, they conducted door-to-door -door inquiries, even asking local people to check their garages and sheds in their gardens for any sign of Helen or anything suspicious really. And they expanded their search as well as searching along the streets. They were also searching fields and wooded areas nearby and volunteers joined in on the search too. And as well as all of this, another line of inquiry that the police decided to look into was Helen's digital footprint. They wanted to look into her phone records and her bank records to see if she had used her phone at all since she went missing or if she had made any withdrawals from her bank account which you would expect to see if she had in fact gone off of her own accord because you know she would have had to buy food and pay for transport.
transport and stuff like that. So they looked into her phone records because it seemed as though Helen had taken her phone with her wherever she had gone. And they found that I believe for all of the time that she had been missing, all of the calls that she had been receiving from friends and family were just going straight to voicemail. So that indicated that her phone had been switched off the entire time. Well, apart from on one occasion, it seemed. You see, the police noticed from her phone records that on the 16th of April 2016, so five days after Helen was last seen, and just the day after she was reported as missing by Ian, her phone had automatically connected to the Wi-Fi network in her little cottage in Broadstairs in Kent, which indicated that she had in fact been there. She had gone there when she left Royston. But then if that was the case, then why was there no sign of her when her brother John went to Broadstairs to find her in the days after she vanished? It seemed really bizarre. It was like she was there one minute and gone the next. But the oddness didn't end there. As I said, the police also began delving into Helen's bank records. And what they found when they did this suddenly made alarm bells ring for the detectives. So they found that, again, there hadn't really been much activity at all on her bank account since her disappearance. Apart from, they did realise that some of Helen's money from her personal bank account had been moved into the joint bank account that she shared with her fiancé, Ian. So Helen actually had this standing order set up where each month £600 would be transferred from her account to this joint account. However, her bank records showed that on the 11th of April, the day that she disappeared, this standing order amount was increased from £600 to £4,000. An extra £3,400 was going to be going into the joint account every single month. And who, apart from Helen, had access to this joint account? Ian Stewart. So that immediately seemed very strange to the police. The fact that randomly on the day that she went missing, this standing order was changed. Why? What was the reason for this? Who made this change? Was it really Helen or was it Ian? But that wasn't the only suspicious activity that the police discovered from Helen's bank records. They also found that her bank card had been used to renew this Arsenal Football Club season ticket, which cost about three thousand pounds. Now Helen's fiance Ian Stewart was a huge supporter of Arsenal Football Club so it quickly became very clear that it was him who had renewed this season ticket using the money from Helen's bank account. So as you've probably guessed as soon as the police discovered this they became incredibly suspicious of Ian Stewart because of the fact that the standing order changed meaning that he would effectively get a hell of a lot more money from Helen each month and the fact that he had bought these season tickets using her money while she was missing. Why is that a top priority for him? His partner, the woman that he claims to love, has just suddenly disappeared and could potentially be in danger somewhere and yet he's using her bank account to pay for football tickets. Why is something like that even on his mind at this point? You'd think that the only thing he would be thinking about or caring about was finding Helen and making sure that she was okay. But no, football tickets are more important, apparently. So upon making this discovery, the police were just like, okay, we, we have to go and speak to Ian about this immediately. However, when they arrived at his and Helen's address, there was no sign of him. He was gone. It turns out that he had gone on a two-week holiday to Spain, a holiday that he was supposed to be going on with Helen. They'd booked this trip together prior to her disappearance. And even though Helen was a missing person, Ian still decided to go. He just went alone on this vacation. I mean, what on earth? Again, why is that a priority for him? Why has that even entered his brain when his fiance was still nowhere to be found? Surely if he was really worried about her, he would have stayed in Royston to help the police with their inquiries and help find her. Although, having said that, he didn't even really do that before when he was in Royston. Whilst the whole community came together and volunteered to go out searching for Helen, Ian did nothing. He wouldn't join the searches for her. You would have thought that being her partner, he would have been the first person to be organising a search party. But no, it was almost like he just didn't care. And you have to ask yourself, why? Why didn't he care to join the searches? Why 
did he go on holiday whilst Helen was still missing? Why was he effectively stealing money from her bank account? Was it because he actually had something to do with her disappearance? The police never really considered him a suspect in the beginning of the investigation, but now, due to all of this very strange behaviour, they became pretty convinced that Ian Stewart was responsible for Helen having gone missing. They believed that he had done something to her. And now, with this theory in mind, it made the police kind of realise some other odd behaviours that Ian had exhibited earlier on in the investigation that at the time they didn't really think much of, but now they saw it in a completely different light, such as his 999 call, the call that he made on the 15th of April when he filed the missing persons report. Upon listening back to the recording of that, the police noticed something very strange. So during the call, the operator was asking Ian and some very basic questions about Helen and what she looked like because they obviously needed to know those details to make this report and Ian just couldn't answer these questions. Like I said, they were some of the most basic questions that you could ask someone about their partner's appearance and he just didn't know the answers. There are actually audio clips of Ian's 999 call online so I'll try and play it for you where I can. He couldn't tell the operator her eye colour, her height, even her date of birth. Birth. The operator asked Ian for Helen's birthday and he did not know it. He'd been with Helen for five years by this point and he didn't even know her birthday. Now I would imagine that at the time no one really thought much of this because you know everyone thought that Ian was this worried fiance who was concerned for the welfare of his partner. So in that scenario it could make sense that he just couldn't really think straight and so was struggling to answer these questions but now that he was considered a suspect in the investigation investigation. I don't know, the police just thought that it was another very bizarre thing. There's also the fact that the note that Ian claimed Helen left him, which said that she was going to go away for a while, well, that was never found. Ian couldn't give it to the police because he said that he had chucked it out or misplaced it or something, so the police never saw it. And now they were questioning whether it actually ever existed. Maybe Ian made this note up to cover his tracks, to make the police think that Helen really had taken herself away when she hadn't. On the 11th of July 2016, so exactly three months after Helen vanished, Ian Stewart finally returned back to his home in Royston following his holiday in Spain. And as soon as he got back, the police went to his house with a search warrant and also an arrest warrant. Despite the fact that Helen Bailey still hadn't been found, they arrested Ian Stewart on suspicion of her murder. So the police wholeheartedly believed at this point that Ian Ian had killed Helen and disposed of her body somewhere. However, trying to convict him at this stage, well, they knew it would be very difficult because they didn't have her body. They really believed that she sadly was dead because, you know, it had been three whole months now with absolutely no sign or trace of her. But of course, a no body murder trial is always incredibly difficult for prosecutors to pursue. And so what the police were hoping for when they arrested Ian was a confession. Following his arrest, he was was questioned down at the police station. The detectives were hoping that he would admit to harming Helen and tell the police where they could find her, but he didn't. He actually refused to say anything in his questioning. I don't even think he responded with no comment to the questions put forward to him. He just stayed completely silent and wouldn't say a thing. Even when he was asked directly, did you kill Helen Bailey? he didn't say anything. He didn't even say no or try to deny it. So without a confession, the police knew that they needed solid evidence against Ian if they were going to charge him because all they had so far was circumstantial evidence at best. You know, the strange bank account activity, the going on holiday, his refusal to help search for Helen. It's all incredibly suspicious behaviour, but that in itself is not concrete evidence to prove that Ian did anything to Helen. And if they were going to prosecute him, they needed to find some. So in an effort to find some, they began really digging deeper into Ian's movements on the day that Helen was last seen. It was found that just before three o'clock on the afternoon of the 11th of April 2016, Ian Stewart had gone to a doctor's appointment, which he had told the police about in his initial statement that he gave. However, it turns out that Ian's appointment was originally booked for that morning, the morning of the 11th. However, he called the doctors and 
told them that he would have to rearrange for that afternoon instead due to having some car trouble. So was that really the case? Did he have to reschedule because of some issues with his car or because perhaps he had done something to Helen, killed her, and now he needed to figure out what to do with her body before he left the house, and so he didn't have time to go to the morning appointment. So yeah, he went to the doctors at around 3pm that afternoon instead, and when the police spoke to his doctor about Ian's appointment that day, the doctor said that Ian just seemed very, very distant, almost like he was just consumed by his own thoughts. He wasn't very present, which I suppose would make sense if he had just committed murder. Following this doctor's appointment, Ian went to the local rubbish dump, which again, he told the police about. He said that Helen had given him some stuff to take to the dump, and he was caught on a CCTV camera throwing a duvet into the dumpster. Now, as far as I'm aware, the police were unable to retrieve this duvet, but it is speculated that maybe the reason he got rid of it was because there may have been incriminating evidence on it, blood evidence perhaps. After going to the dump site, it was established that Ian went to his and Helen's solicitor's office, as apparently Helen was selling one of her properties at the time. She had quite a few properties, and this solicitor was the one dealing with the sale of one of them, the sale of this flat that she owned. And when the police spoke to this solicitor, they actually said that when Ian showed up at the office that day, he was being very, very pushy and kind of aggressive towards them, because he wanted the solicitor to hurry up and push through the sale of this flat as quickly as possible. But the solicitor told him, well, we, we can't do that without Helen because it's literally her property. Later that evening, it was found that Ian went to watch one of his sons play bowls. He also went out for dinner with this son. And then I believe following this, he eventually returned home back to the house that he shared with Helen. Now, speaking of the house, so as I mentioned briefly before, as well as the arrest warrant, the police also obtained a search warrant. They had a warrant to search his and Helen's home in Royston. The police spent two whole days thoroughly searching the property, just hoping to find something, whether that be Helen's body hidden somewhere or just, just something that could indicate where Ian may have disposed of her body. But nothing. They found absolutely nothing. And so at the end of the two-day search, they were getting ready to pack everything, all of the equipment up, ready to leave. But as they were doing this, as the search team were collecting all of their things together, they were approached by one of Helen and Ian's neighbours. And this neighbour just wanted to basically ask the police how much longer they were going to be searching the property, because the search team's equipment included this big electric generator that would apparently make a lot of noise. And the neighbour said that they were struggling to sleep at night because it was so loud. So she was asking them how much longer they were going to be there. And the search team actually said, well, our, our search is basically finished now. We'll be packing up soon we've searched everything. And this neighbour then just made a throwaway comment which would actually turn out to be the breakthrough that the police needed. She said to the search team something along the lines of, oh, so you've searched the second cesspit then. It transpires that Helen's house had two cesspits, one of which the police had searched and found nothing inside of. And there was also a second one in the garage, which the police had no idea about. They didn't know that there was a second one in the garage, mainly because Helen's Jeep had been parked over it. It'd been parked over over this manhole cover which led to the cesspit underground. It was almost as if someone, Ian, was trying to hide it. Maybe he parked Helen's car over the manhole to disguise the cesspit because he had disposed of evidence in there. And actually this comment about the cesspit made the police remember another comment that Ian Stewart had made himself when he was arrested on the 11th of July. You see, when the police went to his home to arrest him, Ian came kept making comments about the garage. He looked out the window and noticed that the garage doors were open and he asked the police a couple of times, why? Why were they open? Now again, the officers didn't really think much of it at the time, but now that they knew about this second cesspit in the garage, they thought, oh my god, was he asking about the garage doors because he was panicking that they were open and there was something in there that he didn't want the police to find? So as soon as they spoke with this neighbour, the search team immediately descended on this cesspit area in the garage and within 
hours on the 15th of July 2016, exactly three months after Helen was reported as missing, her body was found. She was found in this cesspit, lying amongst the human waste, and beside her was her little dog, Boris. His body was also found in the cesspit. Now Helen's body was fairly decomposed in this cesspit. It was clear that she had been in there probably since the day that she disappeared three months prior and therefore when her body was recovered and taken for a post-mortem it was really difficult for the pathologist to determine what her cause of death was but it was eventually established that Helen had died as the result of suffocation and alongside her in the cesspit the police also recovered covered a pillowcase so it was theorized that perhaps she had been smothered and suffocated with this pillowcase however what the police couldn't establish was whether or not Helen was already dead when her body was put into the cesspit. They don't know if she was suffocated with the pillowcase to death and then thrown in or if she was perhaps suffocated to unconsciousness and was actually still alive when she was put in there. I mean both scenarios are just horrendous but to think that she may have still been alive and was trapped in that pit amongst human waste and that she took her last breath in there. Oh my god, it's incomprehensible. And it was the same with Boris, the dog. They didn't know and still don't know to this day whether Boris was thrown into the pit when he was still alive too. It's not known whether Boris was killed and then put in there or if he was put in there alive and just left to die. As well as establishing that Helen had been suffocated, her post-mortem toxicology report also showed that she had traces of a drug called Zopiclone in her system. And Zopiclone is commonly used to treat sleeping problems, insomnia, and it's not a drug that you can get over the counter. You have to be prescribed it by a doctor. And Helen had never been prescribed this. She hadn't gone to the doctors about struggling to sleep, but Ian Stewart had. These were his sleeping pills that were found in Helen's system. It transpires that Ian had actually been drugging Helen with these sleeping tablets for weeks, if not months, before she was actually murdered. He had been crushing them up and putting them in her food, and she had absolutely no idea. In fact, it was actually found through Helen's search history that she had been googling things like, quote, why do I feel so tired all the time? And also, I'm so tired falling asleep at work. Unbeknownst to her, the reason she was so exhausted was because her fiancé had been drugging her, like I said, which to me suggests a huge amount of premeditation here. He had been drugging her for months, I would guess, so that when he eventually did try to suffocate her, she just would not have the energy to fight back and try to defend herself because of how drowsy and tired the sleeping pills would have made her feel. But why? Why did he do this to Helen? What was his motive for wanting his loving and caring fiance dead? Well, it was obvious to the police. Ian Stewart's sole reason for committing this crime was purely money and greed. As we know, Helen Bailey was a very wealthy woman. She'd had a very successful career. She had quite a few properties at the time of her death. She was estimated to be worth nearly four million pounds, according to reports. And if she died, Ian would have got it all, every single penny, because not long before her death, Helen had changed her will so that that would be the case. So that Ian was the main beneficiary of her assets and he would get everything because he himself didn't work and she wanted to make sure that if anything happened to her, he would be okay. She changed her will so that he would be taken care of. That's how much she cared about him and he repaid her for this by brutally killing her. So it was following the discovery of all of this evidence and of course Helen's body when on the 16th of July 2016 Ian Stewart was charged. He was charged with murder, perverting the course of justice and preventing a lawful burial and when it came to his plea hearing he pleaded not guilty. He was denying it which meant that the case was headed to trial. Ian's trial took place in January of 2017 during which he completely changed his entire story. So of course, as we know, up until this point, he had 
denied everything, claiming that Helen had left of her own accord because she was feeling stressed and anxious and that he had no idea where she was or what had happened to her. But during his trial, this completely changed. He wasn't finally admitting that he was guilty, that he had killed her, but he said that he knew more about her death than he had initially let on. During the trial, Ian told this story about how on the day that Helen disappeared, two men named Joe and Nick had just turned up at his and Helen's home claiming that they used to work with Helen's former deceased husband, John Sinfield. They were his old business associates. Ian said that Joe and Nick were very threatening towards him. They would even get physical and try to attack him and he claimed that they were the ones who abducted Helen. They kidnapped her that day and told Ian that in order to get her back alive, he would have to pay them a £500,000 ransom. And he said that he didn't want to tell the police about this because he was worried that if he did, Nick and Joe would find out and they would kill Helen. Although they ended up doing that anyway and somehow gained access to the cesspit in Helen's garage where they hid Helen's body without Ian knowing. That was his story and I think it's probably fair to say that the majority, if not all of the people in the courtroom just thought, what a load of absolute crap. No one was buying this at all, least of course the prosecution, and they put forward their version of events to the jury, which was that after drugging Helen for weeks or months in the lead up to her death, Ian finally decided to kill her on the 11th of April 2016, and he hid her body in the cesspit in their garage along with the dog Boris. Afterwards, to cover his tracks, Ian pretended that Helen had left a note saying that she wanted to go away and it wasn't until four days later when he reported Helen as missing to the police. And it became clear that the only reason he did that was because of pressure from Helen's family. When they became concerned about Helen because they hadn't seen or heard from her, they basically told Ian that he needed to contact the police because this was so unlike her. And so he finally did on the 15th of April. And then do you remember earlier on in the video we talked about how on the 16th of April Helen's mobile phone automatically connected to the Wi-Fi network at her cottage in Broadstairs in Kent. Well it's believed that that was Ian Stewart. It's thought that he went to the cottage with Helen's phone just the day after he filed the missing persons report so that her phone would connect to the Wi-Fi and therefore the police would believe that Helen was still alive and that she had in fact gone there. This was again his attempt to cover up what he had done. But thankfully his plan failed and at the end of his trial Ian Stewart was found guilty of the murder of 51 year old Helen Bailey and he was sentenced to life in prison with a minimum term of 34 years and with that off to jail he went. But that is not where this case ends actually, far from it because you see after Ian Stewart was convicted of Helen's murder and sent off to prison the police began thinking about the death of of his first wife, Diane Stewart. As I mentioned earlier, she died in 2010 because she suffered from epilepsy. Her death was put down to SUDEP, sudden unexpected death in epilepsy. But now, seven years later, in 2017, now that Ian had been found guilty of murdering his second partner, Helen, the police started to think, hang on a minute, what if Diane's death wasn't down to epilepsy after all? What if Ian had actually killed her too and had gotten away with it all this time. So a new investigation into the death of Diane Stewart was launched and Diane by the way was described by those that knew her as being a very helpful and happy and outgoing woman and she worked at a local primary school in Cambridgeshire which is where she lived with Ian and their two sons. It was the 25th of June 2010 and Ian Stewart would claim that he returned home from a shopping trip that day to find his wife Diane collapsed in the garden. It seemed as though she had had a fit while she was hanging out some laundry to dry on the washing line. So Ian called 999 and he told the operator that he had attempted CPR. He'd even attempted to fetch one of his neighbours who was a doctor to come over and do CPR. But they weren't home at the time so he just continued doing it himself. But Diane wasn't responding. It wasn't working. But the operator told him on the phone 
to continue CPR, keep going with the compressions whilst paramedics were on the way. But once paramedics did arrive at the scene, unfortunately, nothing could be done and Diane was pronounced dead. She was given a post-mortem, but because she did have epilepsy, it was just a routine post-mortem carried out in a hospital. It wasn't as thorough as, you know, a, a post-mortem that is carried out in a very obvious murder case. And so, yeah, like I said, her death was attributed to her epilepsy, even though Diane herself hadn't actually had a seizure for more than a decade before her death. Following her death, Ian organised Diane's funeral and he cashed in on her life insurance policy. He got just under 100k, much of which he'd used to buy himself a brand new sports car, which I think raised a few eyebrows at the time. The fact that his wife had just died and yet he quickly used the money that he got from her life insurance to get himself a brand spanking new car. And that was it. As I said, no one suspected a thing at the time. Everyone just thought that Diane really had just tragically and very suddenly died of epilepsy. Until, of course, years later when Ian killed Helen and the case into Diane's death was revisited. Now with the theory that maybe he had actually killed her too. Once again, for monetary gain. The police really started to believe that Diane was the victim of foul play too, for a couple of reasons, but I think mainly because when paramedics arrived at the scene on the day that Diane was found collapsed in her garden, they actually noted at the time that there were no signs on Diane's body of CPR having been attempted before they arrived. You know, performing CPR on someone can cause a lot of injuries, such as rib fractures, just a lot of chest-related injuries in general. And Ian had claimed that he had been attempting to revive Diane by doing chest compressions before he even called 999, let alone when he was on the phone to the operator and she was instructing him to keep doing it. But looking at Diane's body, there was no evidence of this, no evidence that he had tried CPR. And you have to ask yourself why. If Diane's death really was down to Sue Depp, why wasn't Ian doing everything that he possibly could to try and save her? Why wasn't he doing CPR? Is it because he didn't want her to be saved? He didn't want her to survive? Maybe he knew that there was no point in doing CPR. She was long gone because he had killed her. That was the theory that the police now had when the investigation was relaunched, but they knew that proving this would be incredibly difficult. Because paramedics had tried to save Diane when they arrived at the scene, a lot of the evidence relating to her murder, if she was murdered, would have, of course, been unknowingly destroyed by them. And it wasn't like the police could exhume Diane's body all these years later for, I guess, a second post-mortem, because after her death, Ian had her cremated. However, something that the police did learn about Diane Stewart was that she was a donor. She had very kindly registered to become a donor when she was alive so that after her death her organs could be removed from her body and given to someone else that might need them or left to medical science for research purposes. And one of her organs that had been donated was Diane's brain. And actually the police discovered that her brain was still in storage, still in the brain bank seven years after her death. So they might not have had the rest of her body but they did have her brain and so it was examined by a neuropathologist who found, quote, changes in her brain consistent with early ischemia. Now, ischemia is where there is a restriction of blood flow to the brain. The pathologist said that this was down to, quote, damage to the cells due to lack of oxygen and blood supply. The pathologist estimated that Diane Stewart had been deprived of oxygen for somewhere between 35 minutes to an hour, likely due to suffocation. There was no evidence that she had suffered an epileptic fit. Her brain suggested that she had indeed been murdered. She was probably killed in a similar way as to how Helen was killed, smothered with a pillowcase maybe. And with this evidence, the police could now go ahead and arrest Ian Stewart for Diane's murder too. On the 21st of August 2018, so only about a year and a half into his life sentence for Helen's murder, Ian Stewart was arrested in prison and questioned over the death of his first wife, Diane. And I imagine it must have been a shock for him when this happened, being arrested for Diane's murder, because he would have been thinking that he had gotten away with it. Sure, 
well, they'd caught him for Helen's murder, but not Diane's. So yeah, it must have been a real surprise for him when that happened. As you can probably guess, Ian denied it. And just like when he was questioned about Helen's death, he once again refused to say anything, wouldn't even say no comment. He ultimately pleaded not guilty to the charge of murder. And he went to trial a second time in February of 2022, where he was convicted of the murder of Diane Stewart. And for this, he was actually given a whole life order, meaning that he would never be become eligible for parole. He would die in prison. However, he appealed his sentence and according to reports, his appeal was successful and his sentence was changed from a whole life order to just life in prison with a minimum of 35 years. So, I mean, it's still extremely likely that he will die behind bars. But that concludes this case, the horrific cases of Helen Bailey and Diane Stewart, both brutally murdered by the man that was supposed to love and protect them a truly awful case and I'm so glad that Ian Stewart is rotting away in prison never to be heard of again because my god what an evil individual he is but yeah that is it for this case as always please do let me know your thoughts and opinions on the case down below in the comments I would love to hear what you guys think and also feel free to let me know of any other cases that you would like to see me cover on this channel they can be solved cases unsolved cases serial killer cases you name it again you can pop them in the comments below or alternatively I do have a case request form linked in the description box if you would like to go through that thank you all so so much for watching please do give this video a thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already and I will see you again next week for another mystery with Molly. Bye!